Today on Red Dead Radio, you, you get, get spoiled. spoiled. Hi friends, welcome to Red Dead Radio, the Red Dead Redemption Podcast. I'm your host, Jared Petty, and as always, we're going straight to the wild, wild guests. We're going straight to the wild, wild guests. We're going straight to the wild, wild guests. Yeah! Ah, that's us. Yeah. Indeed, it's been a while since we've had two guests simultaneously. Ooh. Yeah. Wow, to my left, you're right, the fabulous, for the first time, appearing on this program, Mr... Barrett Courtney. That's right, Mr. Barrett Courtney. It's like you forgot your name for a second. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was prepared in my head to say beyond. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As I was and then you messed the joke up. Yeah, no, right. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's about par for the course of what you can expect uh, on today's Red Dead Redemption spoiler cast here on Red Dead Radio, the Red Dead Redemption podcast. Barrett Courtney here from Ye Old Imagine Games Network, producer of yes. Beyond, friend of the Kind of Funny Games Network, at all, etc. Yeah. And to his left, the Hello. far right. It's Tina Amini. Tina Amini returns. It's been a while. Yeah, it yeah. has. It has. You were here. You were here about I think fifteen episodes ago or so. Yeah, is that uh, about a month? Yeah, was, in I know, people in okay. people time. <laughs> we do a lot of these exactly. But welcome back, Tina. Uh, Thank the, you. Uh, oh, I always forget the name of your job now. Uh, uh, my title is editorial manager of games. I run games editorial. There we go. Yeah, and that's that, like the, the casual and the official way well, of saying. Welcome it. back. Thank it's you. Really cool it's you. great to be back. And we're here to spoil Red Dead Redemption for you if you didn't get that already. But before we do a couple of pieces of housekeeping to go through first we want to thank our patreon producers tom box Stuart ferguson and jonathan whose generous support makes this show possible if you want to support red dead radio or the other things i do like pockets full of soup hot blip and a jump at all etc you can do that at reddeadradio.com and i hope that you will if you can't support financially guess what those subscriptions and you know following on itunes android places like that Stitcher, that's really helpful. It, it, it allows me to eat. So, and I mean, you can see that I'm not wasting away, but nevertheless. But you're looking yeah. great. Oh, that's kind of you to say. Well, thank you. That's Second why I'm on the show. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we, we put you on the, the videos, you know? Yeah. yeah. In the big bucks. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Making the mm -hmm. big bucks. Mm -hmm. Anyway, there's that. Also, <laughs> Red Dead Radio is produced in partnership with US Gamer. Check out all their excellent coverage of Red Dead Redemption 2 and more at usgamer.net. That's usgamer.net. There's all kinds of things to find over there. Some wonderful coverage of this fantastic game. Great articles, great commentary. I'm very proud to to work with them. You can follow them on all social media channels at US Gamer Net. And today's episode is sponsored by Neebs Gaming, N E E B S Gaming. But we'll get to that later on because right now it's time to spoil. So, in case you didn't get it from this intro, we're going to spoil the game. If you don't want to hear spoilers, come back to the show later and listen. I hope you listen now on account of the fact that, uh, well, you know, your listens uh, add up to, to me being able to continue to do podcasts. But if you finish Red Dead Redemption, we're going to be talking about the end. We're going to be talking about the secrets. We're going to talk about just about everything. So, And also, to be fair, uh, we should also mention Red Dead 1. Because uh, we had Casey DeFrias on our spoiler cast, mm -hmm. and she had not beaten Red Dead 1. so It was a I fascinating know, I juxtaposition. I know it yeah. feels like a weird thing we have to say, but just to put it out yeah. there. Did yeah. she not watch Red Dead in five minutes, written by Jared Petty for IGN.com? <laughs> no. no? Shame. Oh, yeah. I'm going to make sure. We'll bring in our nun bells tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Shame, yeah. Yeah. shame yeah. Casey a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Casey puts up with it's enough It's fine. Crap, we already spoiled it She's for her anyway. Way too hard. Uh, yeah. We were so. like, so you know how Dutch is? Oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, you know how John Marston died? Oh, shit. <laughs> so she didn't know John. She didn't oh. know. Yeah. It was really cool. And you should listen to We planned it really well. To hear her perspective. Yeah, so th that was an interesting part to it because she had to, she didn't know that Dutch was going to be the villain. So uh, wow. to see that lead up and like her and how and when she detected it was really interesting. What was it like for her? Like, I, I guess I should ask her this at some point. I want to yeah. have the show, um, obviously. But yeah, well, but. to channel Casey a little bit, um, Pokemon. But also, uh, <laughs> <laughs> let me just pull out Pokemon. No, no. So uh, she actually didn't, couldn't really tell uh that Dutch was a villain until close to the end, she okay. said. Uh, and I think that's interesting because there are little moments where they see the idea that Dutch is a villain and you can see it start to develop. You can see the kind of downward spiral happening. But for Casey, she was just like, oh, that's a, you know, whatever, a mistake or like he's a little angry today. He hasn't yeah. had his like stew. You know, Pearson didn't cook that much because I didn't give the camp too many funds today. So I think she kind of like, 
explained away some of those things, which yeah. really ties into Dutch as a villain and why we talked a lot about this, but like it, it ties into the fact that he's like not your most stereotypical on the nose kind of a villain. Well, right. yeah, go, go on with that, Vera. What were you saying? Um, I would, I mean. I think Dutch is a very interesting villain uh, throughout. I don't know if they plant the seeds as well. And again, this is because we've played Red Dead 1 before, and so you know where he's going to end up. And so my, I'm, I'm going to have a lot of frustrations on this on this show. I'm I can't wait. This. Frustrations? Yes, frustrations. Well, because, because I think he disagrees with a lot of like the things we were saying. So yeah, okay. and he's, This has been pent up. He's well, this is your moment. Yeah. yeah, and also to preface, I don't hate the game. I really love the game. It'll probably be personal top five uh, favorite games this year, and I do really love the story. I love, I love a lot of moments in the story, but there's also a lot that doesn't work for me, and one of the things was that um, I don't think they really built Dutch up that well, or and, and like I think Casey's perspective is kind of an interesting point, where she didn't really see that, um, and you know she did kind of explain in her head like a different reason of why he would do some of these things, but it felt like you know, we just killed... 50 lawmen or whatever or just like regular people to go uh, rob a bank and then Judge goes and drowns um, I forget his name but uh, Angelo Bronte yeah mm-hmm. Bronte and then that was the moment where it was like whoa Judge is crazy he's like no we also just killed like thousands of innocent people before this moment well, so that doesn't really fair, sell it to me he didn't just drown Angelo Bronte he drowned Angelo Bronte and fed him to an alligator yeah that I is mean, fair that was like a moment where the alligator don't you dare call like, me dirty I'll feed you to an alligator uh, yeah, yeah. but I'll kill you first so I'm kind of yeah, nice yeah, yeah, <laughs> first. So, no I, oh, Tina do you agree with that assessment or do you feel like they did a better um, job with so, it? so actually that's kind of JR's opinion mm. uh, which was like that he wasn't fully fleshed out enough that by the time that he turns into a villain it's not believable but I disagree because mm-hmm. I think he's so nuanced a villain like he's somebody you would know like I have an ex-boyfriend I could relate to Dutch honestly wow where it's, that's yes. terrifying yeah well it's in the, in the sense of because you know dragging in metaphors in the sense of like this person is uh, somebody who's like obviously really capable, somebody who has yeah. managed to get all these people to rally behind him. Right. He's been a really dedicated to the group, to the gang kind of a character. Um, and he's mostly had these more moments where his morality seemed to skew in a direction that everyone else could follow along. But there are these other tiny little moments where he lets his ego get in the way and he gets angry about a specific thing and then gets like drawn in and to that angle. And so... Everybody else is like, whoa, why are you making this decision? It seems like it's really putting us at risk. And he can't hear it because he just needs to be who other people look up to. And so he's not even really a villain. He's just a flawed human being. There's a, I mean, I, not all, but I think most real villains end up falling into that, especially at the beginning. And I think it's a case for me of, of progressive degeneration, that that's the story they wanted to tell, that this is somebody much much like one of the characters says in the game, uh, the, the, which is kind of thematic to the whole thing. You, people don't change, they just become more who they are. Now, right. whether yeah. or not you agree with that philosophy, that's the philosophy of Dutch, I think. Yeah. This is a guy that was always existing on the outside, that always had to have power over people, that always had to be the center of what was happening yeah. around in Big Fish in a Small Pond, right. that gradually progressively degenerates. Maybe it's the traumatic head injury mm. that right. he experienced. Right, and I do and, like that and, they play with that a little bit of like, mm-hmm. was that part of it or it, was it just coincidence? Yeah, I, and that's something that, I mean, in no uh not to take it too far down but that's personalities can change after dramatic head, or right. traumatic head injury sure. uh, Angie and I have gone through some of that yeah. and and uh, that part of the game really hit me because mm-hmm. things do change some after after moments like that for some people and the fact that something I, you, you never quite know what happened at Blackwater but it was yeah, obviously I bad. love that. Yeah, like yeah. something yeah. like something happened, and like people are kind of too like, oh, it was it was like uh, secretly it was messed up, but like oh, it was nothing. Like don't worry about. it. I think it. they were kind of like, oh, well, tensions were high. Like this was a very yeah. specific scenario. They were making excuses yeah. for it. Yeah, um, yeah, a hundred percent. And like it's something that I do really like, um, even though I have uh, slight problems with like how they try to transform Dutch, because um, I don't see like. It doesn't feel like it happened supernaturally to me, at least uh, in my interpretation of it. But something I do like is that at the end of like the or near the end uh, where um, I think it was um, why am I John's well uh, Abigail Abigail, Abigail. Yeah. Um, where they take Abigail and he is like 
nah, we, we don't need to save her. She's just a girl. And uh, the the fact that like he let his um, the the Irish lady as well, uh, yeah. the, the woman um, who was Molly, kind of Molly yeah. like kind of just like threw her to the wolves as well. Um, that is a definitely a very different person than uh, the very beginning when he's like wrapping uh, Sadie in a coat. And it's yeah. like let's like let's get this poor girl out of here. But that's the thing is like he's when things are good, Dutch is good. When yeah. Dutch can pretend he's good, Dutch will pretend he's good. When things are bad and he can no longer pretend, his and his true character comes out. And this is what Arthur really grapples with towards the end when he's thinking like, is this like is this just what happened to Dutch or has Dutch always been this? And it's what you were saying, Jared, about like you know you become who you are towards the end, and that's exactly what it was. So when when he doesn't have this protective barrier of like look how. Good I'm doing because the camp is doing really well and we're in this house now. When yeah. he can't hide behind that and hide behind the loyalty of his gang, like all of this stuff starts to come out. And, so, and you see that reflected. Oh, I didn't interrupt you. No, please. please. Continue. You see that reflected in Red Dead One when he's effectively living out the same scenario again years yeah. later when he should know better. He has learned yeah. nothing. nothing. He yeah. has learned yeah. nothing. And yeah, he just doubts everyone else and, is, and blames everything on everyone else because he's just trying to protect his own ego. He doesn't want to face the reality that, okay, maybe, you know, I made a couple of wrong decisions. Maybe I should have listened to my cohorts instead of just pretending like I'm leading them. He's the embodiment of a, of a story I heard of all things a preacher tell once. I love this, this story. I uh, forget the theological principle if you want here, but I do think it reflects some real truth. A guy named Fred Craddock said that he believed that most people in a moment of true existential crisis were willing to lay down the thousand dollar bill of their lives in one moment of martyrdom or self-sacrifice and do what was so clearly right. He said the problem with faith as he understood it, with life as he understood it, was that you are willing to do that and God takes that thousand dollar bill and says no and he hands you a giant sack of quarters, Mm. drops this heavy thing in your lap and says Give one of these away every day for the rest of your life. That's how you really have to do it. Yeah. Dutch can lay down the thousand dollar bill, but he can't have hand out quarters every day, rain or shine. I think that's that's a lot of who the character is. Hopping for a second to the to the end. When I say the end, I mean the epilogue end here. Mm. When you've got the Mexican standoff, Micah, John, Dutch, Sadie. Yeah, Sadie. Yeah, bet, yeah that's right. And then yeah, Sadie's yeah. there, uh, uh, like gushing out. Right? Yeah. Everywhere. Um, okay. Got them there together, and you have Dutch make that choice. Now, forget what you want to say about the argument around why Dutch makes the choice or what Mike is saying. Or What I want to delve into here is this. How does the choice Dutch made recontextualize what you see in Red Dead 1? Because that was one of the biggest points of the game for me, is that I'm suddenly looking at all of Red Dead Redemption 1 through an entirely different lens. John's hunting Dutch in Red Dead 1, his reluctance to do so, because you don't even hear Dutch's name in Red Dead 1 until fairly late in the game. And the way those last scenes play out, the violence of their first encounter, Dutch coming to the hotel, the killing, all of it is recontextualized for me completely by that moment. What are your thoughts on that? So I think it kind of just backs up everything that I learned about Dutch and felt about Dutch. Um, And I think it's because... He does this thing where he'll give you a little bit, like he'll go and rescue Jack and all of a sudden he's a good guy again, but then he abandons Abigail and like the other women in the gang. And it's, he's just inconsistent. And the reason why he's inconsistent is because he has certain moments and that moment where he decides to shoot Micah is because he realizes like, okay, I kind of can't deny what's in front of me and I'm not exactly committed to killing Micah, but I'm going to do it because that seems to be what's expected of me and it will harm my image if I don't kill Micah. Mm -hmm. And killing John in this moment, I mean, I'm totally like, you know, extrapolating based off of just what I know about Dutch, but not killing John in that moment is more of a like, well, there's not enough here for me to respectfully kill John and then be looked at as respectfully as I always had. So I don't. I don't know if I agree with that because there's definitely uh, looking at all the scenes over again when we were talking about them earlier today. Um, when Dutch walks away and looks at John, he's got this like kind of look of disgust, like yeah. you made me do this, and it. I. I don't. That scene did, kind of fell flat for me um, because it's hard to tell where Dutch is. Um, Especially, it's. I think it's about seven years after um, Arthur dies, mm-hmm. and um, it because it's been so long since you've seen him, it's hard to tell where he's at. And then, like Micah does mention, like, "Oh, we're gonna do one last quarter together," and all this stuff. And I, I honestly, to me, in that moment, that moment felt like 
the writers put themselves in a corner. Mm. How do they get themselves out of here? Because we're setting up the scene to make it seem like Micah and Dutch are in leagues together. Like they've just, they're meeting up together for the first time in a while and they're going to do the score and whatnot. And if Dutch hadn't shot Micah, there was going to be no way for um, for John and Sadie to get out of there alive or maybe just Sadie. that They might have been able to play around with that. But that scene didn't really sell it to me of um because i get what you're saying of the that ending possibly recon, uh recontextualizing the first one because he kind of lets john go yeah he um, lets john go and he, i he has and, a chance to kill john marston and, and it will cost him nothing and again, it felt well, flat except for me. his pride. Yeah. Except his pride, but John hunts him down and kills him. <clears throat> but mean, as you said, semi reluctantly. Yeah. And I think it's because he has this Dutch has this really great ability to make you doubt. Yeah. And yes. and make you doubt whether or not like oh well you know he had these really great father figure moments so is he really that bad of a guy maybe he's just a flawed human being maybe that's fine. Yeah. For me, that scene was really hard to grasp what they were trying to go for because. I didn't understand Dutch's motivations anymore. And I think they succeeded. I think they were purposely going for that of like, what is this dude about? It's hard to tell. He is very inconsistent. Yeah. But I think they nailed that too well to a point in that last scene. I was like, I don't I don't know what you're trying to do anymore. Like you felt like okay. they were just kind of throwing it for a loop for no reason? Yeah, that's that's how I felt. Uh, for me, it was I felt much more in, in line with the Mad King. Uh, I think I'm closer to... Mm. To Tina on this, that here we have because there was, Huzzah. yeah. That, 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 no, I, d- I definitely know I'm going to be in the kind of a yeah. That's why you're in the middle hot seat. We're, 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 which, by the way, maybe I'm naive. Like I, I think I'm pretty good at guessing story endings. I didn't think we'd see Dutch again. I didn't think we'd see Dutch again either. And by the way, when we saw him, I felt so betrayed. Me too. Like, even though he'd already betrayed me so many times, I still felt betrayed, which, God, that's powerful. And I didn't feel that uh, either as well, because you were mentioning that before, is that I already had felt betrayed when he'd left Arthur, depending on what ending you get and how he leaves you. But, like, when you have the good, good ending... Um, and he just kind of walks away from me. I was like, well, that you suck. And I, I didn't really... In that moment, in that last scene, I really felt that. I was like, God damn it, Dutch. Him walking when, away? Yeah. And so I felt it more in that scene than I did in this last scene. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think... Well, because you're playing as a different character, too. So you're supposed to be feeling different things. Yep. And I think it is, I guess, kind of jarring to step into the, the boots of John Marston. And then all of a sudden yep. have this relationship where you're thinking about, oh, right, I'm John Marston now. I'm not Arthur Morgan anymore. So you have to like kind of adapt your brain to thinking about well, that specific relationship. I've had people complain about the pacing, or I've heard people complain about the pacing in John's section of the game, feeling like you spend too long as John. Yep. One of the reasons I disagree with that assessment is precisely what you're pointing out. I think you need time to get used to being John <laughs> yeah. so you can have that moment. Yeah, I, I think I, so too. I also think that half the game map effectively Castlevania castles up in front of you at that moment, yeah. and they assume you're going to be spending a lot of time exploring yeah. Before you finish the game. And mm-hmm. I think a lot of us covering the game kind of raced through the John sections. Yeah. And that, yep. that feeling may have more to do with the way we played it than the way it's meant to be played. Right. And I do think, like, the, the amount of time that you spend as John Marston is um, really, like, fleshes out his love story in a way that you wouldn't have been able to do without spending like a good amount of time there. Yeah, and I'm like, D- agree. You guys are selling it more. <laughs> but, like, uh, I have a big yeah. problem with the epilogue because I think. My problem, because I get, like, spending enough time with John to have those moments pay off where he, like, proposes to Abigail. And I was, like, ugly crying when he proposes to Abigail. He's so sweet. John Marson is the sweetest man. I know. And where he's, like, acting out, was like, why don't we go take a picture? And, like, let's go see, like, the movie. I know. And those moments were And she was like, why are you weird? I know. Why are you being weird? You stop being weird, Abigail. And where she's, like, making, when you go take the picture and she's, like, making fun of him for, like, ah, you're a poser now. And so, so, like, those moments were, like... Uh, I love this, but yep. uh, the frustrating thing for from my perspective, going through roughly ten hours, um, is that when you get when you get close to the end, the last ten hours feels very different, and like the theme of the last ten hours, I think, is super different from what the f- first fifty hours build up. Totally, to be. yeah. Um, and I don't because I don't know because it's one in one game, kind of one story. It, it, it I that transfer or that switch to a different kind of theme and slightly different plot didn't 
really it didn't selling. Do it for yeah, you. it didn't do it for me. But again, those like those moments of like the montage of them building the house, the yeah. uh, like the the moment when Abigail and Jack come home when you've bought like when yeah. everything's built. Those those were the moments and like the um, the last conf- uh, confrontation with uh, with Micah, which. Um, I, Micah. I know, uh, and uh, the, uh, I think the other frustrating thing for the last fifteen hours in general was that I kind of predicted almost everything, except for Dutch being in the last mission. Uh, okay. Like from the moment you get diagnosed uh, with tuberculosis uh, as Arthur, um, I was like, "All right, this is going to be a very slow death," which is the opposite of what they did in Red Dead because that death is very unexpected. But they're doing this. For a reason, I do like that, of, like, kind of the entirety of Chapter 6. It's, like, this slow go of, like, all right, you're going to die. And we had talked, like, a week beforehand of, like, I was – and I told you that, like, I'm pretty sure the next 15 hours plays out like this, this, and this. And you're – we were kind of going back and forth, like, what if they, like, kind of switch it? And, like, he doesn't die and stuff, and they built up that expectation. No, he's going to die. Yeah, I know, I know. The nature of tuberculosis. (laughs) But again, like, because I'm dumb and I didn't go to college, so, like, I was like, (laughs) – does the medicine, like, kind of, like, does that exist yet? I didn't know. but yeah. uh, And I didn't know until earlier today when y'all yeah. were talking about it. Um, and so my my frustration was, like, Micah's going to be the one who would truly rats us out. Arthur's going to die. We're going to play as John for the last ten hours. We're going to go through the entirety of buying the farm. They're going to, at one point, make a joke about John never going to Mexico. Mm -hmm. And then the last mission is going after Micah. And I predicted all of those things at the beginning of Chapter 6. That's pretty amazing. You're a better prophet on this game than I was. I I had some of those beats figured out. And Mm -hmm. Western storytelling, cinematic Western storytelling, is often fairly predictable. Yeah. um, And we also know what happened in Red Dead 1, so we know what they have to do to set up. What what I thought we were going to get was one big tremendous super disaster kaboom and we didn't that yeah. was where they got me yeah. was the gang dies like arthur dies very slowly sl- well except lenny stingly well no god we'll get to lenny lenny. And, uh, lenny lenny gets it but but that chapter six death, <laughs> there is no giant climactic pinkerton battle there right. is no it's, it's, it just all not but a bang but with a whimper yeah, yeah down to the camp functions vanishing and the and it's so I loved loved that but yeah that was the part I didn't predict also I thought they were going to throw us a curveball and we weren't going to play as John we were going to play as Sadie I was really um, convinced that we were going to play as yeah Sadie. I wonder if yeah. they just didn't predict how much of a fan favorite she would be I mean I'm sure they did but I don't know maybe they're going to maybe they're going to ground Red Dead 3 on it DLC that'd be cool or yeah, DLC, or DLC. I, I doubt they'll do single player DLC yeah, I, put everyone plays as Sadie in Red Dead Online I think yeah, they, they knew by, I think they knew by the end that Sadie was was a great a big character, character. yeah, yeah. They, they had to know Oh, man, I love her so much, and I love that she got out. I love her and Charles, like a, a, as yeah. far as we know, like uh, kind of going through the post credit stuff. Right. Or yeah. like you see her leave, and like I was convinced, like going into that last mission, riding to Micah, I was like, and they're talking about what they want to do after this. I was like, oh my god, they're gonna die. They're gonna. Die. Like, <laughs> well, they do was, a great job with that. I, they d- that was. I will give them credit for the ending. Was like they really make you think, like. These these people are done. You see that knife going to save you. You're like, how are you not dead? I yeah. Know. And like Charles Seriously. gets shot in the first five minutes of like yeah. the first minute of being there. You're like, oh, it's a total. Disaster it was in already. dire straits there for yeah. a while. Yeah. And uh, so yeah, I was, was really wondering if they were going to give me the option not to go after Micah. I wondered. Yeah. Uh, no John. one would take that option. I would. So, I would. Really? really? Why? Yeah. What you just want to like? I wanted let... John to. I wanted John to learn. I wanted John to listen to Abigail before. So here's the thing, though. He doesn't entirely listen to Abigail. It actually kind of results in this compromised situation where he's like, listen, I'm going to do things legally, but like bounty hunting, I'm so much better at than farming. So if you want us to have a life and you want to have a life with me, who's like a former um, gangster gunslinger, yeah. like yeah. this is just kind of the reality of that. And so I'll, I'll, do, I'll do the thing where I do things only legally, but like this is kind of what I'm good at and who I am. So she accepts a little bit and he accepts a little bit. That's and that's compromise like yeah that's an excellent point i like oh, that thanks. a lot no i agree with that we're going to take a quick break here for our sponsor if you don't mind Ooh. are you all familiar with neebs gaming no Do you know nope. neebs you guys know neebs neebs is great uh, i i ran into neebs a long time ago actually and there are sponsors this week neebs do some really cool things they're a youtube channel and what they do is take really well edited well crafted scripted machinima they they take gta 5 and they make these 
funny, funny, funny videos in cinematic mode, edit them in post-production, do multiple voices for all the characters, yeah. put them together into little mini movies and drop them on their YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Gaming, and they're hilarious. I'm they're, into it. They're, yeah, they're just like, they're, first off, they have a very, very good talent. They're good at funny voices. That counts for a lot. I mean, truly good at funny It's hard voices. to do a funny voice. It is. They also do things where they'll pop into games and they kind of do some not malicious, griefy type stuff, but that's really cute and funny when people are taking themselves seriously. They're they're neat. I like neeps. But they're doing a new series based on, G- or on Red Dead Redemption 2 called Bad Arthur. Oh. Uh, no. <laughs> and uh, Bad Arthur just debuted. And, uh, There's so, no such thing. <laughs> uh, so we're here to talk about Bad Arthur on Neebs Gaming, uh, which debuted November 11th, is available now at youtube.com slash Neebs Gaming. That's N-E-E-B-S-G-A-M-I-N-G dot com. The Neebs folks are funny. I highly encourage you to go over there and take a look at it. I am not funny, so I admire people who are. Are you funny? I used to be. I used to be in theater and I could actually tell jokes and deliver things funny, but then I grew up. Oh, well, you grew up and it ruined you? Yeah. Oh, is that what growing up does? Uh, it, it, yeah. <laughs> wow. I know. Okay. Tina, are you funny? Uh, well, I think that if you are funny, you inevitably probably have imposter syndrome and think you aren't funny, so I really don't know. Okay. So My answer really couldn't really be an answer. Her. She's got a really good dry humor. Sardonic. <laughs> yeah. That's that New Yorkerness in me. Yeah, like sardonic. <laughs> it's in New York. Back to New York yet again. Anyway. <laughs> Tina Amini 2, Lost in New York. Uh, Neebs Gaming, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Check them out. That's our sponsor this week. Thanks a lot, Neebs. Have a good evening. Go uh, watch those guys. Now, back to the discussion. All right. Uh, you said it. Before we get to some questions, I want to ask about specific moments. Lenny. Lenny! Lenny! Oh, my God. And it's such <laughs> like a... It, it's one of those things where... Um, in movies growing up, I would always be frustrated when they get you emotionally invested in uh, in someone and then quickly kill them off and not have, like, a scene dedicated to it. And that's very much what Lenny's death is, is, like, it's not even a cutscene. You're just in gameplay and he dies. And But I grew up, like, when I became a grown-up and uh, stopped being funny. I you started became a grown-up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Aren't and, you like 12? <laughs> in his <Maybe>. heart. <laughs> um, I started to appreciate those kinds of scenes more where like it's just boom, gone. Because that's very much what, I mean, that's what death has been sold to us in our construct of what life is. Yeah. But um, yeah, it was very just like he's gone and you have to kind of just walk over his body and it's really sad. Uh, I think that yeah. the, one of the reasons it works so well. Oh, go ahead, Tina. Yeah. Oh no, I was just agreeing that it was just really impactful, yeah. Yeah, yeah they... they First off, you have a death immediately beforehand, which, which is, is a cutscene death, which is dramatic, and you see it coming. You can feel it. You know, you, the moment you see, the uh, moment you see him held there, I and know. you're like, okay, you know he's going down. And there's the cutscene, and the, the, the mic it goes down. No, yeah. you know, and you're like, okay, there's the big impactful death, and there's no cutscene cut. The fact that it happens in gameplay, you yeah. come around the corner and Straight. there's a bang and down he goes. Yeah. And th- I like that because it really increases the gravity of it because yes. you're just like, things are happening. Could I have done it yeah. to, like, to save it, to make it different? But like, also like, not, there's like, so much happening around you and yeah. like you just kind of got to keep barreling forward. Now, did you bet, see my Arthur, I stopped, by, like I stood and Arthur yeah. bent down he by took the a and moment. lingered. Yeah. It's he the only time in the whole game that happens. Yeah. yeah. Like, because it's, it's Lenny. It's your drinking buddy. It's I Lenny. It's Lenny. I love he's Lenny. He's, why did you love him, Tina? Um, well, because first off, he's incredibly smart uh, and intellectual. And he the way that he speaks, I find, like, I really appreciate uh, his, his penchant for that kind of conversation. There's yeah. a moment in the camp where he's talking to Dutch about a book that Dutch is reading. And it's just really fascinating. It has nothing to do with anything else going on in the game except maybe some, like, setting, like, tone setting, um, environment setting kind of contextualization. Mm-hmm. But he He's just like he's just an intellectual and he's he's really thoughtful and the way that he carries himself is just really kind of calm and kind of like mediating these conversations in a really smart and kind of really really put together way. So I just I like that. Mm-hmm. But at the same time you had this like big drinking scene with him where things go off the rails and you guys so get good. silly together and you get into fights together and like also that drunk scene was just perfect. It was just perfectly yeah. made. Uh, I could not stop laughing when I played and through it. So 
good it's my because, favorite like, they scene. They nailed what it's like to be Ugh. just so drunk. They nailed it. Yeah, <laughs> they just they 100 percent nailed it. And there's just like all these like funny moments in between, and then these like you about random to get into a weird fist moments. Fight, and yeah, then you're, like down like the line. Yeah, on yeah exactly. It's just yeah. the flashes of it. Yeah, and then at the end when they're both like running off in their own directions, oh, trying not to get caught. And so you had that experience with him. You had that bond with him. Yeah. Um, and that's certainly a thing, you know, when you share a drink with someone, when you go out and have a drink with someone, that is part of the experience that you have because you're just both like in the same mindset together. Yeah. And then that next scripted event you have with him, I think, is when you're in Lemoyne riding together and suddenly you're talking about uh, about the the world that Arthur's grown They've grown up in the same physical universe, mm-hmm. but Lenny has grown up in a very, very different they world. They have such different experiences. Than Arthur. And, I think there's and, even a moment where Lenny's like, you just wouldn't understand. And Arthur's like, yeah, I probably wouldn't. Like, yeah. it just, it was just very real and kind of honored the, their differences in yeah. a way, but and in a friendship. way that they were, exactly, in a way that they were still like kind of brothers coming together. And you yeah. could tell there was a trust there, familiarity, comfort. It was I mean, just really well done. You got an idea that, that Arthur had in a lot of ways. Because Arthur is kind of a quiet intellectual. He's mm-hmm. much, much more, he runs much deeper than he lets on. Yes. That's very clear. That maybe he had more in common with Lenny than anybody else in yeah. the gang. Yeah. Um, yeah. He, I, he just like wasn't, because he knew even before he got sick that it was probably close to being over. He didn't like, there just wasn't a vulnerability to him yet. Um, until the point where he's talking to Rainfalls about yep. all the kind of personal stuff. But that also, yeah. like, in a weird way, that moment with Rainfalls, um, or Rain's Fall, I forget. Uh, but he, in, in that moment, you could tell that he's kind of letting his barriers down. Because he is a very quiet person. He's yeah. more of, like, an inner intellectual than, like, someone who's a little bit more outspoken and likes to have those conversations. But, um, I like, in that moment, it really is because he's just, like, at the end of his rope. And he's, yep. like, might as well have this conversation with this person who's so far removed from the normalcy of my life like why don't I just pour out all my burdens on him like you would like a bartender or something have you ever had a conversation with somebody that you don't know all that well that you discover you implicitly trust the person within a relatively short period of time and end up sharing more intimately than you expected with them has that happened to you before like every day yeah <laughs> no, I'm, I'm a very probably. like I'm a very trusting open book mm-hmm. kind of a person so I have these kind of conversations all the time but I like in for him and Rain's Fall I think it was more about uh, he's never really going to see this person too much it's not part of his life there's not there's, so there's no uh, repercussions to kind of oversharing and I think that's like where that comfort comes. It's more for him to work out his thoughts out loud with somebody, like kind of bounce it, it off kind of, of somebody. Finally, like process it and put it in. Yeah, order and, exactly. Because you know. it's not something that he's used to doing, at least out loud. Yeah. Okay. What about you, Barrett? Uh, I am very, very close to the chest and don't talk to people. Um, and uh, I do really appreciate games uh, that have come out this year, like God of War, Celeste, and even Red Dead, that um, kind of tackle people being bad at communicating with others Mm -hmm. um so but i've i'm absolutely sure there's been a time when i talked to someone i've probably known for maybe a day and Mm -hmm. totally confided in them in something that i probably shouldn't have and yeah (laughs) well sometimes it's it's weirdly like safer yeah and there are times when you'll meet somebody that i'm this is fresh in my mind because this literally happened to me this week where Mm. you talk to somebody you don't know all that well and discover that something intrinsically makes you believe this person is trustworthy and we have an empathetic relationship, something in common. That yeah. Who knew? Well, and also, I think, like, just to even, I mean, I don't think this is what Arthur was doing, but, like, just to connect to other human beings, like, you share a little bit and they share a little bit, and then you have this, like, mutual respect for the fact that we've mutually shared this thing, and so there's, like, a certain level of trust. So, basically, Barry and I don't trust each other at all. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. That's why we came onto this podcast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to find other ways to connect. Yeah. How'd y'all play the scene? Because uh, he does let you just go up there and barely talk if you want, or you can... Oh, I always talk. Yeah. Yeah. Chatty. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was a. Uh, it was hard to like kind of learn about his past, like his son. Yeah. His son at one point. What a was surprise! Like, Jesus, and I was still theorizing that like even until the end, past the point where they basically prove he has no more connection to to John's family than yeah. just the friendship. But I was convinced that entire game that Jack was actually Arthur's son. So was I. Um, yeah, I thought yeah. that too because they had Ar- such weird allusions to yeah, it. Yeah, when like they go out fishing together yeah. and yeah. Uh, there's just there's something in that moment and even kind of leading up to that where it was just like 
And there's this like weird rift between Arthur and John, mm-hmm. um, especially. You have to be- wonder where it comes from. Yeah, and like it obviously came from when John left and, yeah. what, and whatnot. Um, but it was purely just out of a when you learn in that moment that um, Arthur had a had a son, not Jack, and died and whatnot. You learn that the reason why. Arthur has been so adamant about John sticking with his family is because Arthur didn't have that choice. Yeah. And that is actually one of the, like, I was sold a lot on, like, kind of the small moments in this game. And that was one of the ones that just wrecked me. I was like, oh, it all makes sense now. And it's just a face button menu option that yeah. you could skip. Exactly. You could miss that moment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, and how? never know that information. <laughs> and that's a lot of bravery in game design. Yeah, being mm-hmm. willing to let us do it makes it so much more meaningful. Well, it's funny because like if you spend a lot of time in your camp, you'll get these like little snippets of conversation that give so much context to things, or maybe not necessarily context, but depth. Yeah. And so th- there's so many moments in Red Dead Two where you could just be missing all of that story, and even like doing participating in stranger missions and everything else. Like when you have that ride to Dutch, the the final confrontation. Yeah. Well, it wasn't really final, was it? But when you have that like the r- final long one for ride, Arthur, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I suppose when you when you ride along to him and you're replaying these lines of dialogue in your head, like some of them are from those camp moments, some of them are from stranger missions, some of them are for story missions. So if yeah. you didn't participate in those, you would miss out on so much. And I think it's really interesting because it means because Rockstar kept saying like you know Arthur is your character, you can play him yeah. in, in your way, and like everyone's gonna have these minutia of a little differences in in what they've experienced, and that's a big part of it. Yeah, and that uh, that just makes me think a little bit about the end when you're no longer Arthur of like building up this character, and this is kind of a problem I had with the first one, um, is that you spend so much time with this person, and there's of course like a lot of extra open world stuff to do. So when you're playing as the second character, I never felt compelled to explore those things because I wanted to do that with the the first person you play as. That's interesting. Um, well, so yeah, yeah, and now like it. JR we were talking to earlier like kind of brings up a a really good point where it's really weird for John of like you have the option to go like out and rob trains and stuff like in between the time of like him starting this farm and the the government coming after you to be like hey hunt these guys down and then all this stuff and there's just a lot of I love Arthur so much that I was like I don't know if I want to go out and do this without Arthur Mm -hmm. and uh um, with Jack, it was just like you don't really know him a lot as a character, so I just yeah. never felt compelled to stick with him. That's fair, but like for two, since you do know John, I mean, if you played one, like if since you do know John, there is something really poetic about stepping in his shoes, and because it bridges the gap between the two stories, but in a way that isn't just told through cutscenes or whatever else, it's told through you carrying mm-hmm. that out and becoming the man who he is in one. And the payoff, that beautiful payoff. For me, and my second favorite moment in the game, Lenny's death is my favorite moment in the game. Oh my god! No, but it's so uh, sad. How, no, no, how no, could you? No, I think you monster. But I think it's the best done moment. Yes, in the yes. Game. Yeah. Uh, but okay. For all the reasons we just talked about, the mm-hmm. fact that you don't see it coming at that second. Yeah. The fact that they chose to do it in engine. Yep. In it, the fact that lingering, the fact mm-hmm. everything, yeah. it hits all those little beats. It's one of the hardest hitting deaths in a video game ever, mm-hmm. besides um, the horse. Uh, oh, that Depending. especially if Depending. you got the horse to live the entire time. Oh, yeah. I did. And yeah. I was so proud. Yeah. And they killed Bojack Horseman, and I was very upset. <laughs> Bojack they Horseman. Killed glue. Glue. Yeah. I know. It was messed That's, up. We were hanging out like a week and a half terrible. ago. I know. Well, it could have been worse. Had I been riding my other horse, they would have killed Zach Ryan. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> so, <laughs> if That's only. That's a joke from like the, the <laughs> Breath of the Wild yeah, games. Yeah, I've been using I've been using Zach Ryan. Oh game. man! Zach Ryan was the first horse I bought, and Glue was the second. Oh, you could have um, said no. They killed Zach Ryan. I know. I know, I know. <laughs> Missed was, opportunity. Who, who died for you? Uh, my horse. Yeah. Uh, so I named all my horses after Farsi words that like describe their coloring. Oh, cool. So, oh, yeah. Okay. Um, um, so I had a. a I just want to couple. remind you that you abandoned your first horse to go after the cool white horse. I just. I never didn't. I whistled let... him over. All right, if you say so. Uh, do you speak Farsi? I do. I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, that's really cool. Yeah, oh wow. Yeah. Say something cool in Farsi. Uh, what does that mean? It means what do you want me to say? <laughs> ah, <I'm right. laughs> Excellent. Sorry, I, <laughs> languages are cool, and I've never they are cool. Them. Yeah. How do we come up with so many? I don't know. We're a busy bunch. Yeah. You know, we're creative. Like the uh, three of us alone created all languages. It all worked. I mean, I took four years of French and don't speak a single word. Uh, Parlez-vous, France. Anyway, all right. But going back to the second favorite moment um, after the death of Lenny, I and I think this is a lot of people probably didn't like it when I've gone through the life mundane with John. And Abigail's left, 
and it's time to go out. And I reach under the bed, and there's the Marston outfit. Mm-hmm. That moment and was I cool. I pull it out, and I put it, and it comes out, and the sun is shining, mm-hmm. and a freaking singing cowboy Gene Autry song comes on. Like, yeah. I mean, it's like Roy Rogers, and that shouldn't work in this game, <laughs> but it does. It's just like, I'm John, I'm back. Yeah. I'm going to go make this all better. The sun is shining, the birds are singing. My old friend has returned. Well, it's like you have a superhero costume. That was a cool hype move. Yes. Yeah. Moment. Yeah, that was yeah. like a suit up. Like. Yeah, exactly. But, it's but like it's just, a, you abandon your suit for a while and then you open up the, the drawer and there it is. But instead of it being like, boom, 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 yeah. it's like, and the melody of yeah. the yeah. plane. I'm like, I love this so much. <laughs> the one thing I will say about his outfit that's weird in this engine uh, compared to the when you see it in Red Dead 1 is his gloves are comically huge. <laughs> well, that's why I never wore gloves with Arthur because they look so awkward so, But general. like when you go look back at Red Dead 1, yeah. I had to look at a picture. I was like, there's no way they're comically huge. And they're not. They look like regular gloves. But in this one, they're just like... They make his hands look twice the size. I had that they not are. noticed that. It, look at that. It drove me insane for this like last five hours. Maybe also, it's because they had to make the gloves interchangeable in this one. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Also, Arthur is very skinny. Like he has the tiniest well, make waist. Nice. I mean, sorry, oh, not John, Arthur. Yeah, John. Yeah. John has the tiniest waist. When he's yeah, like he's when you dude. first like yeah. have him like just in like the the shirt and the, yeah. and the pants. Yeah. Yeah. Freaks me out a lot. Yeah. John, yeah. Long John's John is is great. Like yeah. running around in his red long yeah, John yeah. Is all, all like scrawny is pretty yep, fantastic. Exactly. Yeah, yep. I'm with you there. What are your um what are moments that you loved? What what stood out that you just like, man, I sure did love this beat turn. Um, so I mentioned too already, I really like the Lenny drinking scene. I loved the riding to Dutch final confrontation scene, but one that I didn't mention was building the house for Abigail. Oh that whole montage. Yeah. It's just for several reasons. One, like I think the the gameplay of it, um, it's very QTE based, but it like really evokes the amount of work that John had to put into building that house. So you feel a connection. And when you step back and you look at the house, you're like, yeah, I built that thing by pressing a few buttons. It was crazy, man. It <laughs> took me like took me like two minutes of, of clicking buttons, but I'm pretty sure it was like six months in game time or something. Yeah. Um, and you know, by the end of it, you have got this like full bish, really bushy beard. Yeah. yeah. I hate John Marston with a beard. It's so weird. <laughs> it is it weird. Yeah, he out. has to be like five o'clock shadowed yeah. and long hair. I, yeah. That's the only way. Yeah. Um, but you know, you're, you're working with Charles on it and like you just see the dichotomy of who Charles is versus who uncle is like uncle sitting there drunk barking orders at you yeah. and Charles just like being really genuine and down to earth and helping you out I want to see their sitcom I really want to see yeah, Char- seriously. Charles, Char- uncle, uncle and John, yeah. John living yeah. together that's pretty much what together. it was that sounds like an incredible can we make that? that like amazing. We have three people right here. There we go. Red Dead 3, I'm just saying. I have some more of these yeah. doors. We can build a set. Perfect. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah, I'll just press a few buttons, make a couple more of those for you guys. Yeah, It'll be great. Cool. Yeah. I, I do want to watch that sitcom. Sidebar on, on Uncle. Is Uncle what's going to happen to John Ryan when he's like 80? Like, is that is that where he's headed? Where he's got lumbago? No, no, no. Where he gets whatever. tortured and like... No, I know. No, what what oh part God. are you That's talking like about? This, this old old man hanging around in his long johns, like barking. Nah, John, John, John's too much of a hard worker. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. He is pretty yeah. industrious. Yeah. That's true. Mm-hmm. That's true. But what if we all just, like one day just the work runs out? He runs out of energy. Maybe that's what happened with Uncle. He was yeah. like, you know what? No, I'm done. He was Retirement. A guy yeah. That's what <laughs> yeah. He worked on strategy, guys. <laughs> like I'm burnt out. Oh man. <laughs> Too that, real. Too real. You're yeah. right about the house building though. Also sitting there going, one, the music's great. Yeah. Two, you're putting the effort in. Yeah, it's you're like, bonding with Charles and Uncle. And three, saying they're going, oh well, there will obviously be home and ranch construction in yeah. Red Dead Online. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Well, the other the other reason why, like, honestly, the biggest reason why I love that scene is because I I love John Marston as a man. Like, he he didn't believe in this ranch. No one believed in this ranch. The banker, people at the saloon, everyone was saying, like, oh, you bought that piece of shit. Yeah, but he did it. Yeah, like he did it because that's the one thing she wanted. And even if it was this uh, to him unreasonable thing, he just felt like no, like she she wants this. This will give her security, and I will make this work. And he put, like, his blood, sweat, and tears into this house. I mean, I didn't see him crying, but I imagine there was blood and there was whatever blood. else. There, yeah, there probably was. Um, but And he does it for months. Yeah. And, like, nothing deters him from it. He is so forward-focused, so dedicated. And, like, that's the loyalty that Dutch was constantly, like, craving but didn't really even understand. Yeah. It's loyalty to the, to the extent that he didn't need affirmations to continue working on the house. He did it because it was the right thing. He decided it was the right thing to do and nothing was going to interrupt 
interrupt him from that and he's just focused on it and you like going through that montage like, like nothing else is happening and and like he's just dedicated to Abigail and it that's all she needs to see and yeah. even though and even though she's really um not pleased with the fact that he's going around doing this bounty hunting stuff she still feels like okay well like look what he's done already yeah. like he clearly has that dedication there's not a doubt in her mind after that fact that He's willing to do things for her even when he doesn't believe it. And it's, it's the most romantic thing. I love John Marston. Which means he has so much to lose. God, I mean, it's again, yeah. the first game and even harder. That's the other like, thing. Like, he doesn't even know if she's going to return. He's doing it anyway. I love John Marston. Did you just want to release <laughs> the television during the credits and kill the two agents who are looking down the hill? Yeah. The farm? Which yeah. was also weird to me because they find their farm. And, like, I was talking to JR about this. It's like, oh, it could have been a thing where, like, even though you play the game afterwards, that scene could have happened a couple years later. But no, in that scene, you still see like Jack is the same age, but they find the farm three years before the events of Red Dead One. So it took yeah. him like three years to like figure out how to make him work for them. I'm or... not sure that that was the priority at that point. They find mm-hmm. John, but they may be trying to figure out the right way to use him still. Um, gotcha. I, I could That's be wrong. Fair. That's I, fair. I don't know. What about you? What's a, so John Marston so romantic? Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> Uh, Barrett, what's something that, that really jumped out at you? One of the favorite moments, um, I mean, there are a lot of moments that shocked me, uh, definitely, that stand out of um, the O'Driscoll boy who um, rides back and his head's blown off and that because uh, he, he kind of talked uh, to the Vanderland gang about the O'Driscolls, and that was very, that was very upsetting because you, um, I forget his name, um, isn't it? It's something with a K. Mm-hmm. Um, and they really grow at the beginning when you like have him like tied to the yeah. tree and he's like, come on, please help me. I'm like, nah, screw you, O'Driscoll. And they somehow made me care yeah. about him through uh, just like little tiny things. And it was just like, that was one of the first moments where you're like, oh my God, like this is all going to crap. And of course that's after like Sean dies because Sean dies at the end of Valentine? Yeah, Sean dies in the shootout when uh, when Cornel- or Leviticus Cornwall comes to uh, comes to Valentine. Yeah, and, and that's like and, that's and, a hard one. And by the way, I don't know if you noticed his head's not blown off. He's holding. Oh, he his head. yeah, he's yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's yeah, like, yeah. He's holding his head because um, there's a moment where some like, sleepy I think it's hollow Hosea shit is like holding, or it's either Hosea or Micah is holding his head later yeah. on. Like, yeah. Oh my god! Get rid of it. So just so. St- messed up and that was, that was like one of the moments that stood out to me it was like oh my god people are going to start dropping like flies now yeah um, you're just being and that's what happens for the kill that whole thing yeah. Yeah. yeah and like um, I did love like when Mary is killed it's not Dutch that does it it's um, oh wait oh yeah, yeah, or yeah. Uh, when uh, Molly when Molly it, it's uh, yeah oh, oh Grandpa Miss Grimshaw yeah when, Grimshaw yeah, when she's the one who does it you're like damn like, and she does it oh, without a moment's hesitation my girlfriend yeah. Alyssa was watching that scene and she was like kind of dipping in and out and I'd catch her up on like what's going on in the story and she watched that moment she's like damn girl get it like, <laughs> yeah. you don't well, mess the, with snitches you know? <laughs> well the sad thing is, is that like, later you discover that she didn't actually which I was yeah. also on. confused of like why would she lie about that if she knows the rule right yeah if like that was because they you don't really know Know the rule before that moment yeah. of like if you snitch you're killed yeah. and I don't really understand what her end goal was there of like I get that she wanted to get Dutch's attention but it's like you know the rule if you snitch and you yeah. say like you're that's gonna not snitch. gonna get you anywhere she might have been wasn't she I was gonna say like wasn't yeah. she kind of drunk like acting yeah. kind of drunk oh she was very so. she was yeah. Yeah, yeah. trashed yeah, so I, and there's there's moments where she was trying to get um, Dutch's attention and she was trying to get Arthur's attention. Yeah, and yeah. I think she just felt so like uh, not heard that she yeah. said, you know what, maybe if I throw this big realization thing in their face, then they'll listen. Dutch will pay attention yeah. to Yeah, him. which yeah. he did, yeah. Um, then get, she got blown away. Yeah. And, and that I, guts the camp. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's like kind of, the, that's the other uh, first moment where you also see like, Dutch is not the same person from the beginning of the game. Um, the other moments I like, like I love seeing um, Sadie for the first time after, like as John and whatnot, and like, oh my God, she got out and she's like doing okay for herself. Yeah. And, and I just love seeing like in the kind of uh, end credit stuff of like, um, who's the guy who like uh, cooks for you and what? Pearson. Pearson. Pearson of just like, he's got his little shop and he's got like his uh, picture of like the gang and stuff. I was like, it's oh adorable. man, you're so good. all sad. Too. I know, like, oh. I know. And like, I love that they do cho- a toy with like, um, like building up so much of the relationship between Charles and John and Charles got to like kind of 
go out and do whatever. And um, yeah, there was just a lot of little moments here and there. Lucy like, Tilly is a mother, if I remember right there in the mm-hmm. same credits. She's yeah. in she's in Saint Denis, I think. Another one question I wanted to ask you: Did you go on the date with Mary? Yep. Uh, there, yeah, and that's after you um, mess up the or like uh, the dad you rescue, mission. No, I think it's the brother. It's the brother because the dad one you're a little bit more conflicted about. No, no, it's after. It is after the dad. It is after yeah, the dad yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, yeah. the brother one is when you're still out in the country, and the yeah. dad one's when oh, you're okay. in the city, okay. and then you go to the play right. or go, yeah. the show. You go to the theater. Yeah. And da, 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 da. And did you did you focus in on her and Arthur during that? Yeah, show? I was trying to. Did get, you yeah. make a move? I tried to so hard. I tried to too, and because I was work. just I was sitting there like this the entire time. I was like, oh my god, I love this so much. Yeah, if you focus in on them, it gives you an option yeah. that says make a move. I tried, but then he like goes like that and gets awkward, and then he kind of brings it right back in. I love that. Their date and John and Abigail's date are kind of bookends. I, I they're yep. almost mirrors of one another. Yeah. Well, so I mean, they're they're parallels, yeah. and then they're also you know bookends, as you said. Yeah. So they, you know, both both um, Abigail and Mary have a problem with John and Arthur's lifestyles, respectively. Right. Uh, and but I think there's different contexts. So if, yes. on the one hand. Uh, Abigail has a son yep. you know John and her have a son together so that obviously like kind of raises the stakes and then on the hand for uh, Arthur and Mary they have too much baggage where like the father disapproved the entire yeah. time so I think they had more strife in their relationship and that's why it, theirs was very tense whereas John and um, Abigail's date was very playful and like very natural well, like there was more changed. love there yeah. there was well they had reached a place of love. I mean John had left his wife and child for a year yeah John had done a lot of all awful things we meet at the beginning right. but yes by at that point in yeah life, they were far they more together. established together yeah. yeah i i really liked that like i hate mary i hate mary so much mm-hmm. um and like one of the biggest reasons i hate mary is because after you rescue her brother uh she turns around and like there's no reason for her to say this whatsoever she's like you'll never change like what what did i even do to you all i did yeah. was go out of my way when my <laughs> my family is in in dire straits themselves and there's so much that i could be doing should be doing for them and i took time out for you and then you're just going to chastise me over what over some grudge five years ago which to be fair like might be incredibly justified but it just felt like in that moment why did you do that why couldn't we just leave it on this tone those two are never going to work together yeah Yeah, and the other question is when um when arthur talks about his son do they ever say who the mother was a waitress that died Gotcha. Oh, oh right, right, right. I'm remembering yeah. that story now. I think um, her name was Isabel, but I'm not sure. Um, do we know around what time that happened? Does he say like how far? Are you trying to like suggest some kind of infidelity? Um, maybe there might. It's have been... the Wild West. Whatever. I know. I know, I know. <laughs> uh, but I, I really like the, the exactly. I really like the the side stuff with with Mary because I think at first it's not like that is like a mission that they point you towards, but then all of the stuff after that is stuff that you can do optionally. Um, the first one's even optional. Oh, All really? of them are optional. Yeah, I and like, and I only pursued them because I just wanted to see how that story played out. Yeah. But yeah. honestly, especially the way after she talked to me, that, you know, that specific way before, and like, here's the father, and like, you're not even giving me any kind of like substantive thing. You only reach out when you want something. Yeah. There, but yeah. it is like, as far as writing goes, it was really illustrative of how dysfunctional the relationship was. So I guess it was effective yeah. in that, and it's effective if I don't like Mary to this much of a degree, mm-hmm. but still. I, I liked it just because I, I kind of just saw into the head of Arthur where he knew there was no, no way. But in the back of his mind, there was still like this little glimmer of hope of like, there might be a chance that I can get out and we can have well, this life. And, and again, it's just so more tragic because you know it's not going to happen. But that yeah. exists inside himself. I mean, that's one of the parts, that, something to think about here that this is, I'm just going to project my own life on things for mm. a second. I sometimes feel pressure about yeah. things. And I'll feel pressure about maybe what people think of me or what I have to get done or what I and more often than not, what feels like pressure coming from the outside, when I stop and think objectively about it, is is happening inside me. Mm. It's not coming from outside. It's coming from what I think ought to be done at that moment or what I my expectations are set as. Arthur Morgan could have walked out of that theater with Mary and gotten on the streetcar and never looked back. Yeah. He, that what tied him to that gang outside of what was existing inside him? He had nothing in that camp worth going back to in terms of possessions, or he had no one dependent on him. I guess they were dependent, but they, would, they could live without Arthur. But he couldn't make himself 
see that or want that. And it's okay that he didn't make himself see that or want that because she, for him, was probably not the right person. But there was a third path. He could have walked away from all of it. Yeah. Potentially, but at the same time, they actually couldn't live without him. I mean, what would end up, what, what would happen with John if it weren't for Arthur in the yeah, end? And I think true. like, you know, John was one of the few people who identified what was going on with Dutch early on. But no one would listen to him because he was just yeah. the guy who abandoned everyone. Right. But with Arthur, he was Dutch's number two. So if Arthur's beginning to have that doubt and Arthur's empowering other people to walk away and to recognize like things are in shambles, we shouldn't just blindly follow Dutch anymore, what other leader would they have? And from the beginning of the game, I always felt like like every time I would walk in camp, Dutch is just like hanging out with Molly or like smoking a cigar or something, yeah, like lazy, drinking. Man. Like yeah, and I'm sitting I'm anything. I've looked at the ledger. Okay. Like yeah. when did Dutch contribute anything? I'm it's like, always I'm Arthur, like Arthur, Arthur. A hundred dollars at yeah. a time and everybody else is like maybe two bucks. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Someone Dutch donated a friggin' first. carrot. Like come on. Yeah. But so <laughs> but genuinely like, you know, I, I actually did feel um, Um, And I'm a crazy person, so I take notes like as I play games. And one of the notes that I took for myself was, I feel like the camp relies on me. And that was early on in the game. And so that might have just been a gameplay thing. But in general, I felt like I had so much control over the way things would, would, you know, pan out. And I I felt like I had purpose. Absolutely. yeah. Yeah. And I felt like I had Dutch's ear. So it was like, I really had this obligation to keep Dutch on the straight and narrow. Oh, I think it's great storytelling on their part. I just, I, I think that for me, one of the things that kept coming to my mind was, it won't make as good a game, but if, if we just I, ride off into the sunset if, with Mary if, and or, deal or with relationship Mary, drama or, or, or something else. Yeah. yeah. But if Arthur had left, what if the camp had disintegrated after Arthur left? Because if Arthur's left, why should we stay? Right. Yeah. Would that not have been better for almost everyone involved? If Arthur left? Yeah. And well, they think, left I think too? things would have, well, if everyone left, but that's not what was going to happen. Well, that's what I wonder. If Arthur left, what other people have left? Uh, maybe when they when but I think that they needed like I think that Arthur did empower them as I said so like I I do think that they needed another voice and that's what someone like Dutch like why he's so attractive to people is because people need especially in a group they need someone to look up to like that's why leaders exist at all because they need someone they can trust and say okay well you know this sounds like this is a really tough situation and a option A and option B are both shitty but one is less shitty and this person should have the experience the moral compass so on and so forth the capability to pick the less shitty option for Mm. us and I don't want to have that power for the group and so that's what like befalls Dutch and Arthur is sort of like the angel on his shoulder um, Mm. or you know with his own angel and and devil on his own shoulder so I do think that like without without Arthur without that moral balance uh, the things would have ended very differently for the gang how many children did the O'Driscolls have I know right yeah, I, there were a lot of Odriscolls. I feel like I killed like a whole city's worth of Odriscolls. Yeah, there are a lot of Odriscolls yeah. in this world. Did the, was it in the like lore or canon or whatever that they were that they were just a family? No, I think that, well, I think the idea is they're a family because he's Odriscoll. And yeah. they're not all family. They're part of his gang. Right, they're part right. of right. but some of them are family. Mm-hmm. I, I think that that was one of those cases. But I'm working on a piece for you right now uh, for IGN about um, about the historical accuracy of Red Dead. One of the notes I, I make in that article is that this game exists kind of between three tensions. Uh, One, it has to be able to render a world that is historically accurate, that that is is really grounded in this kind of beautiful reality so that it can be so beautiful and gorgeous and dirty and grimy and it has that fidelity we relate to. Also, because it's a rock star game, it has to be cinematic. It's Mm. got its roots in the wild bunch. It's got its roots in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. It's got, you know, there's got to be this romanticized Western mythos mixed with that grounded reality, that these these cinematic inspirations. But the third piece of tension there is it's got to be a game, and you need enough O'Driscolls to shoot. <laughs> uh, yeah, we got the Lemoines, you got the Pinkertons. Right, but, but you've adapted like you've built a core combat mechanic that's effectively a, a shooting gallery style mechanic, and uh, that that they lay out. And that relies on enemies that take one or two bullets to take down. And if you want long, tense gunfights, you got to have a lot of bad guys. So that's why I think there's a lot of other skills. Gotcha. I could be wrong about that. (laughs) For more on that, see IGN. Yeah, Uh, yeah, but 
we're going to take a, a kind of a hard left turn here. I like this. Uh, mm. And uh, and I'm going to have you pop in real quickly on a segment we call the Red Dead Redemption drinking game. Oh. Ooh. Um, we've been doing this the last couple of weeks. We had John Ryan and Andrea Renee uh, mm-hmm. comment on this. But things that happen in Red Dead, you take a drink every time they take place. Right. Mm-hmm. What do you got? Mm. Uh, someone talks about a horse. We haven't had that yet. That's new. So every time somebody talks about a horse. Yeah. Okay. But like, there are a lot of. Lot they of, talk about horses a they lot. They do. You're right. And I actually really love it because they, they talk about horses. I mean, the whole thing and in, in with the gameplay with, with horses is that you build a bond. Yeah. Um, but they all talk about it and kind of reinforce that gameplay mechanism where it's, you know, every, they all like really felt bonded with their horses and they still remember horses' names from years ago and like when they met and when they died. That's one of the reasons that I, I know some people were not crazy about the traversal. I felt closer to my horse because I spent so much darn time getting places. Yeah, and I have a lot of frustrations with, uh, or more frustrations, I feel like, than uh, both of you. But I actually, the one thing I never understood was uh, the critique of going around all the places. You like that? Part yeah, I did yeah. like it. It kind of, you kind of got the sense of this being a world. And I think they pulled that off better in this one than they did in the first one. Because I went back to the first one earlier this year and yeah. it just didn't connect. And plus you have all these opportunities for side missions and like yeah, the exactly. random encounters, stranger missions, yeah. legendary animals, whatever else. And all this would happen as you were traveling yeah. and it felt right. And sometimes things, you know, Javier would run up and be like, you know, Bill's been captured by the gang. Like, yeah. oh, well, I've got to stop right yeah. now yeah. in the yeah. middle of this. So exactly. Go that. And, or like somebody would blow up the path in front of you on your way because you piss yeah. off some other group or gang of people and then you'd have to deal with that. Bounty yeah. hunters are after you, whatever else. <laughs> John and I were talking about, about the two times you meet Snake Man and we're saying, you know, we're hoping there's a third time that he's just covered in snakes, mm. like uh, just hanging off his body. Again. I don't think I've met Snake Man. You haven't met Snake Man? No. Snake Bite Man? A, yeah, he's a good one. Snake oh, bite I mean, man. I, I mean, I've met people who have had snake bites, and I've given them like no. Antidotes. If you meet snake bite man, you'll know. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, snake I bite did man meet like a, a a crazy dude in, in the water, and then he followed me for a really long time, and I got really scared, and I pointed my gun uh, at him. Like the end of the game. Or yeah. Like Mar- yeah, I, I remember that dude. Where he's like kind of what is weirdly, he doing? I don't yeah, know. he's like kind of like a, he seems like he's kind of um, possessed by something. Oh, I haven't met him. And yet. yeah, and then he comes like running after me, and I'm I'm still I'm walking, and he's still like following really closely, like yelling all this random stuff at me so I turned around and pointed my gun at him just to threaten him and he was so terrified and ran off Whoa, yeah it was a weird that. interaction like what's another drinking game moment <sighs> okay I've got, I've got two ideas here this Ooh. first one's probably one that's been done before every time you lose your hat Oh. No, we haven't done that. Ooh, there you go. Uh, Boom, no, there you go. people will get far too drunk on that one. <laughs> um, I mean, I have played a drinking game, a Harry Potter drinking game before, where one of them was uh, take a sip every time they save the full name Harry Potter. And Ooh. my girlfriend oh. Alyssa and I did that, and we watched the first Harry Potter movie. Because it's the first one, they say his name all oh, the time. Oh, yeah. Hey, In brother. the first 20 minutes, we had down a... Uh, I will not finish the rest of that yeah. sentence. <laughs> too much. But yeah. yeah. But anyway, that uh, I play dangerously. Yeah, and <laughs> by the way, remember... Remember with the Red Dead Redemption drinking game, don't drink if you're underage. Never drink and drive. Don't drink too much, period. Yep. Don't drink if it's an unsafe environment. Just, just you know. Drink responsibly. Drink responsibly yes. and yeah. only if it's legal and you're of age at all, etc. Please. Exactly. Uh, don't drink enough that you're going to get sick. Please don't take a drink every time somebody says Harry Potter. Says Harry yeah. Potter. <laughs> or loses, or their, loses hat. their hat. The I, other I don't one... lose my hat all that much. It's usually mm-hmm. melee. It gets shot yeah. off. It gets shot off melee. all the time, yeah. The uh, the other one I had, depending on the gender of your horse, is when uh, every time my horse uh, was a boy, so every time Arthur says... Boy, because <laughs> yeah. you might say it more than Kratos. So yeah, I'm yeah. Saying. <laughs> yeah, good boy. Or what if it's a girl? Made a super cut of this, just like cutting between. Oh, every yeah. Boy, oh. boy, yeah. Boy. There well, you go. yeah. For game of the year deliberations, we should just have both. Like that should just be our video. Actually, we should, we, we should do a joke video where it's like, yeah. what's game of the year? Well, how many? And it's like everything kind of like ties up. Like, oh, they do this and this and this perfectly. Which one says boy more? And then yeah. we like do a just tally and they just it. Have it's a lot of work. Celeste be like, me, 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 boy. <laughs> just a little bonus I yeah. so there's a there's a um, drinking game that I've never played but I think it's hilarious um, and it's mostly for uh, other media so like TVs and movies gotcha. um, but you put a mustache somewhere on the TV and every time it lines up you take a drink <gasps> but like how cool would it That's be because mustaches like and facial hair so you put a mustache and every time it lines up on someone you take a drink my art that's a Great. <laughs> I'm going to do that. Yeah. Um, and that's a great. I've never heard of that game. That's spectacular. <laughs> my Arthur grew a mustache from my very first trip to the barber. 
and never changed facial styles. I just kept mm-hmm. drinking that hair tonic and growing yeah. that mustache. So it was level 10 mustache all the way nice. through the game. It was, it was fun. I saw this thing on Reddit where someone had a, um, a bandana, you know, the bandana on, the very useless yeah. bandana. And they pull the bandana off. The title is like Freedom or something. They pull the bandana off and this giant bushy beard just comes <laughs> plopping out with all its physics. It's, oh, it's so cute. cute. <laughs> did y'all um, did y'all know, like, did it jump out at you the moment where you're first playing as John and you go to the barn to shoot the guy with the double barrel and you're looking down at him? That and he's just got, like, nothing left on his head. He just froze yeah. and it's the box art for Red Dead 1. Wait, what? No, I don't. You catch that? No. No, there's. You, if you look, John is he's holding a double barreled shotgun in one hand, looking down. It is the yeah. box art for Red Dead One. Oh, yeah, very cool. Because they, they changed the angle shot to make it look yes. up at him. And it's suddenly yeah. like, you're like, oh, like, it, it's, yeah. it's so cool. Self referential. Yeah. It brings you into the game. For, yeah. It's like, oh, I'm John now. This is like when really they say, yeah. This is like when they say the name of a movie in a movie and you're like, ah. Oh, that's <laughs> it. That's it. They did um, it. So the Castlevania 2 or Castlevania Symphony of the Night thing where it flips over to the, you know, suddenly like, wow, the whole West is open and it's a big, empty country, very, very, very different than yeah. the rest of the country you've explored here so far. Um, I really enjoyed and appreciated that that old world is all there outside of Mexico. Uh, so far, right? Nobody's made it to Mexico, right? There's, there's, uh, there's apparently a leak or something a couple of weeks ago, or, or like not a leak, but someone kind of like spoiled early on that they like glitched into Mexico mm-hmm. or something like that. Mm-hmm. So it is there. It's just not. It's yeah. It's probably just like not rendered or anything. It's just okay. like off in the distance. Um, but yeah. Okay. I like that the original world is there. Uh, but John Ryan also put up a kind of made a great point of like. It's weirdly like a little uh, lore breaking in a way where if you go into Armadillo and like meet the store owner there and you know because it's Red Dead 2 and you have the option to do anything like JR killed uh, the store owner there who Mm -hmm. is the same character in Red Dead 1 but is alive in Red Dead 1 so it's like a weird like well, kind of none of these things would happen unless you're terrible, like John Ryan. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like a horror. I liked that. Um, I want to ask because obviously you, you all understand you've worked in this industry a long time. The, the the degree of work that goes into any open world game of any kind. Uh, there's definitely a giant playground for an incredible open world experience. I think our next episode is going to be like about what we want out of the Red Dead Online. But do you see any universe where that pre-built world and the pre-rendered characters and all the assets that already exist are used to add Red Dead Redemption to this engine? Uh, as as a this is something that you guys were also talking about we earlier talked a little today. Bit about yeah. It, yeah, like there's the possibility since there's a lot of overlap. Um, there's a yeah. lot of it'll be a huge amount of work. I'm not. Yeah. yeah, I'm not. It wouldn't be that much of amount of work if Mexico was involved in the conversation. But because it's weird, like since Mexico, the, there's so much down there that they would have to also rebuild. Um, well, I suspect we'll see Mexico eventually anyway. That's interesting. I, I'm not convinced. Um, it would be cool, um, but also like. You know, there was talks for years about uh, GTA Five having store DLC yeah. and all that stuff, and I don't know. Again, like, I'm very new the, to this industry, so I don't pretend to know how any um, company works, especially Rockstar, because they're kind yeah. of just in their own stratosphere of all the, all the stuff that they do. So it feels like they're naturally staying, kind of straying away from, like, extra story content and just building on like here's our game and then let's build on a cool online infrastructure Mm -hmm. that's around this game so it would be one of those things that they announced it i'd be like oh dope Mm -hmm. gives me a good excuse to go back and play that game in a way more modern take yeah i think i think think they trim a bunch of missions honestly i think it'll be a shorter game Mm -hmm. uh take out most of the racing missions trim Mm -hmm. some of the fetch quests Trim a lot of Mexico. Mm-hmm. And uh, modernize it. Yeah. Um, but I think they could do it. I, yeah, because there's been so many improvements from one to two, so they wouldn't want to just, like, you know. Oh, I, th- I think you could make a, like, as much, Red Dead 1 I love, but I mm-hmm. think it would be, looking at this engine and that map, it would be better as a 20-hour contemporary mm-hmm. game. 
like if if you just if red I, dead one yeah well, it, it, it kind of one. it kind of if you're just going through the story it kind of is about like 20 to 25 hours yeah it's, it's not know. that long so maybe oh well, i was talking about with exploring and everything and yeah, all yeah, stuff. yeah 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 when i played straight. it earlier this year i was like just barreling through the story because it'd been a while oh, like okay. i was just trying to catch up on story stuff so yeah, yeah. But yeah, the other bit is, I mean, the online is obviously a, I did the show because I want to cover the live service. I mean, that's the Mm -hmm. real thrust of what we're doing here is to head into that. GTA Online was such a revolutionary uh, piece of software. And I think Red Dead 2, Red Dead Online, is probably all the best ideas that they had for GTA the last two or three years that decided to save for this. So, Mm. I mean, the home building ranch building camps yeah. i'm done camp yeah the fact that you can like decorate your camp even in the single player game like yeah. that gives a little hints and magic cooperative camps cooperative sim city gang camp headquarters i'm into it pinkerton headquarters bounty hunter groups yeah, yeah. play as a white hat play as a black yeah. hat like it's gonna oh, it's gonna be rustling and mm-hmm. raiding <laughs> and, yeah and then right around the time that they're like oh you've done all you can with cowboys they just drop on dead nightmare we've got werewolves yep. vampires ghosts oh, yeah. You know, yeah. stuff like that. Aliens. Yeah. Aliens. Could be. Cowboy versus Aliens DLC. I want it. <laughs> push, us, push the game to 1917 or so and suddenly you get a World War Two or World War One airplanes uh, flying around yeah. and Zeppelins and, so weird, you know, like how, crazy like, stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Time errors. Oh, yeah. World, or Red Dead Redemption I have no concept of ends, time because I'm so young. <laughs> yeah. Red Dead 1 Because you're 12. <laughs> three years before World War One. That's so weird. Yeah, That's the so airplanes weird. exist in that world. Like, yeah, I remember out. like yeah. they they talked about that at the very beginning of Red Dead One, and then yeah. again at the end of Red Dead One, and it was a really cute moment. Yeah, mm-hmm. so that hot air balloon was fun. Yeah, I liked it. that was a sad. That, I was very sad because like the the poor like balloon operator guy is like, oh, I felt oh, so gonna, bad for him we're yeah. gonna like train you up and then yeah. like Arthur's like no nah, we're gonna go to this prison and but also he was so out. excited he like loved being on this little like, like on, having these yeah. hijinks and antics yeah he was you. like ah oh, like we did it and yeah. we escaped and then he just dies Boom. Like, on the other hand he also looked at Sadie Adler and was like oh the fairer sex cannot fly yeah, I don't think he, he also was yeah. very yeah. very yeah. sexist yeah, yeah. yeah. he's like women don't can't be in the air it's all science and I was like it's just like a Ron Burgundy moment um yeah i gosh thank y'all for doing this yeah it means a lot you coming over here as i know it's an evening after a long work day for you it's very kind that you chose to be a part of this it's our pleasure we're just hanging out with you you're wonderful guests um i uh i look forward i think we got to do we got to do the what we want from red down the line we got to do the sadie adler chronicles because we didn't get into sadie tonight not too much yeah Yeah. and i but i think the show's gone long enough and y'all probably want to go to bed so Mm -hmm. um Thank you. Anything you uh, anything you want to plug in, in the work that you do? No, I mean, we if you are interested in Red Dead, we got plenty of that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> and we uh, got a bunch of cheats and a bunch of wikis. I will need. plug uh, Podcast Beyond, which you uh, can tune in uh, every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time uh, on beyond.ihn.com or uh, everywhere else like YouTube and podcast services every Thursday at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, and yeah, that's what I was, all sh- I was sharing my disappointment with you here. I, I don't understand. You've got to... You gotta find staff over there, but you and the bush over there running the running the podcast beyond. Yeah, I love Red them. Coverage. I think they've been doing an excellent job. Not one phone Genuinely. call to the to the only person in the world to run Red Dead Radio, <laughs> Red Dead Redemption podcast. Uh, you'll have to history. take the uh, that up with my uh, my boss Jonathan Nordbush. Uh, <laughs> call your boss buying toilet paper at Walgreens. Yeah, I'm joking. Jonathan fun. is not my boss, but uh, I do yeah. love that. Probably 30 minutes after you and I were hanging out and talking, you ran into Dormer just playing yeah, toilet paper. That was beautiful. It was a lot of fun. I mean, everyone buys Did he just, paper. like, True. ditch it immediately? No, it was, it was like, like, oh, pretend like it was a gag. Standing in the middle I'm buying of the cigarettes. I'm cool. <laughs> big, big thing of toilet paper. And he's waiting at the photo counter because he needed a passport photo. Oh. Yeah. But yeah, I never just passports and toilet paper. Yeah. Uh, I think yeah. when people buy things, it's a lot worse stuff you could have been buying than toilet paper. That's I mean, true. You know, That's true. That's fair. But it was it was pretty it's pretty great, great. Yeah. yeah and I was like you want to go get, like, get a drink and he's like well I have this toilet paper <laughs> <laughs> so maybe, I'm kind of uh, responsible for the toilet, toilet paper, paper now that so was kind of his yeah. <laughs> yeah Jonathan Dornbush ladies and gentlemen I'm gonna get him on the show someday. yeah I keep inviting him on and he's he always got something to do so uh, he's playing too much Tetris Effect to really focus on Red Dead you know what I'm saying and Tetris Spyro effect. soon Kingdom Hearts oh that's, yeah once Kingdom he's Hearts he's a busy boy yeah forever. he is indeed we'll never see him again no. probably not even us we won't even see yeah. him anymore well he is the Kingdom Hearts whatever the Heart Kingdom Hearts 
are, you know, I, well, anyway, mm -hmm. I'm not going to get into that. All right. <laughs> well, just negative B plus minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC over 2A or whatever the heck is going on in Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching. Until next time, happy trails. Thank you.